Treasurer Michael Sukkot joins me now. Uh, from Sydney, though, Michael Sukkot, thanks so much for your time. This must be uh, just off the back of your appearance on Q&A last night. We will get to that. But first of all, taxpayer funds going to Liddell, would this be limited, in your view, just for the five years? Well, Laura, I, I didn't exactly spell out that uh, taxpayers' funds necessarily should be used. I just said that what we know is we're going to have a shortfall of dispatchable energy. The mm -hmm. Australian energy market operator has said that. Uh, and uh, I said to Patricia, and I repeat it with you, uh, we need to do whatever we have to uh, in order to ensure that that dispatchable baseload power uh, remains in the market to cover that shortfall. Because, uh, quite frankly, as we transition to a, a greater proportion of our energy being created by renewable technology, mm. uh, we need to ensure that that dispatchable baseload power uh, isn't transitioned out of the market too quickly. Otherwise, you get issues like what we saw in South Australia with a statewide blackout. We've had a succession of other blackouts. And importantly, you have uh, very, very high electricity costs. So okay, let's look at Liddell and uh, sorry yeah. that what might happen there because AGL is on a big a PR drive today. It's taking a, a tour of journalists through the plant, no doubt to show how ageing uh, it is and that uh, some of its boilers just cannot be replaced and where the millions of dollars uh, need to go. First of all, what do you think of this PR drive and is this just a, a signal that perhaps AGL is just telling you and the government what it wants to hear and in 90 days it's just going to come back with a, a plan that it already had in place and that is for uh, solar panel, panels and a gas peaking plant to re uh, replace that dispatchable power that will be taken out of the market in 2022 when Liddell closes down. Well Laura who knows I mean AGL are ultimately the ones that can answer that question. I would just repeat though let's remember AGL uh, is duty bound to do, to do the best thing they can by their shareholders and the best thing for their shareholders is to run the most profitable business they can. Uh, and we know that they've been extraordinarily profitable uh, while electricity prices are increasing. On the other hand, as a government, uh, we have the interests of uh, all Australians at heart, and that is to meet three key objectives. We want to ensure that our electricity remains affordable, that we have a secure and reliable electricity system, and of course that we meet our environmental targets. So our objectives are not identical to AGL's objectives. AGL's objectives, quite properly, quite rightly, mm. are to maximise the profits for their shareholders. And uh, the fact that we might have a divergent view uh, just shows that we're not beholden to uh, any big corporate. Uh, we're not beholden to uh, vested interests in the market. Mm. Uh, we're here fighting for Australians to ensure that they have affordable electricity and a reliable electricity market. OK, well, we'll see where that ends up in 90 days. Early December is the deadline uh, for that. Ross Garner made an interesting suggestion uh, this week. He's been part of this energy debate for a number of decades. He's an expert in the area and a respected one, I should add. Uh, he's suggested that uh, the government should legislate two carbon reduction targets to break the political deadlock here. Um, and if the prices stay the same, pursue the weaker target. But if prices do fall, uh, pursue a higher target. That sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Well, Laura, we've already committed to a target. We've committed to a target of reducing emissions by 26 to 28 per cent by 2030. But you also haven't implemented yet a CET, which would, would be critical in terms of reaching that Paris target. Well, I, I'm not sure I agree with you there, Laura. I mean, okay. there are a range of ways in which you can abate carbon. And uh, this idea now that there's only one road to doing so is, uh, I think, incorrect. I mean, one of the things that the Finkel report has starkly indicated is, yes, we need certainty in investment. Yes, we, knew we need new generation. Mm. But it's got to be the right type of generation. It's got to be generation uh, that is dispatchable, that is reliable. Because uh, sadly, uh, with uh, the way that renewable energy technology operates at present, uh, particularly with the lack of storage, uh, quite frankly, if it's not sunny and it's not windy, uh, we need to be able to rely on sources sure. of base load energy. Okay. Now, um, we've got the target. There are a whole lot of ways that you can meet those reduction targets. I don't accept 
that there's uh, simply one way in which you can do that. Okay. An interesting uh, point my colleague Paul Murray made on PM Agenda, the last word, uh, yesterday. Uh, and I wonder, as someone who's been looking closely at the housing market as well, whether this might be an idea, that any new building uh, needs to have some kind of uh, battery uh, installed in that building. Like if there's an apartment block going up, uh, there needs to be, from the developer who bears the cost, uh, some kind of of uh, renewable energy or um, home battery storage technology in all new buildings. Is that something, I guess this might be state jurisdiction, but is that something that you would urge the states to consider? Well, it is a state, uh, a state jurisdictional issue. I, I would just caution you and Paul, <laughs> uh, there's, there's no cost borne by developers. Uh, developers don't bear any costs. I thought they you might say that. that. Well, because it's self-evidently true. So it would every, be passed on to every, um, the every cost, cost of a house? Gets would it, passed yeah. on. It, it would get passed on and what we do need to ensure as well is with a more fragmented uh, a, a f more fragmented electricity grid that mm. uh, there's the capacity uh, to handle uh, that uh, sort of mandate would be uh, you know in, yeah, oh, but possible this is, in this an is a government sense. that's uh, been pretty keen to intervene in markets. You could intervene here and make sure uh, developers would bear the cost, wouldn't you? Well, I don't have any, uh, in principle, objections to the idea, but uh, the idea that the cost wouldn't be borne by the end users is wrong. I mean, if you look <laughs> at the cost of new housing, I mean, one of the statistics that is uh, not, uh, not spoken about often enough, and maybe I'm guilty of this, we need to speak more about it, is 44% of the cost of a new house is made up in government charges, fees and re other regulatory imposts. Now, if you put another regulatory impost which says, OK, you need to do X, Y and Z okay. for any new dwelling, uh, trust me, uh, that gets passed on to the end consumers. Now, it may, it may be a worthy cost. I'm just not sure of the proposal that okay. Paul's coming up with, so I probably well, we're, can't We're comment. just here on the, the morning shift to you know, help you with policy formulation <laughs> and you know, to, to, for you to take it on board. But uh, we'll see where well, that's that one ends up. That's why we're so happy you're back, Laura, because <laughs> we've been missing uh, these things for the last few months. Oh, yes, indeed. Thank you so <laughs> much. Now, one final question on same-sex marriage. I know uh, this is something that you discussed on the Q&A panel uh, last night. John Howard has accused leaders of the right of your party of running dead on the issue. Uh, Scott Morrison, Peter Dutton, Matthias Corman. Uh, Scott Morrison was very clear where he stood yesterday uh, with David Spears. Uh, Peter Dutton was very clear with where he stands uh, today here on my program. Um, the protections for religious freedom, if this yes vote get up, are you confident that with their leadership that would be adequate? Well, Laura, uh, obviously John Howard's a hero of the party. He's probably uh, one of the, if not the greatest Prime Minister we've had, probably behind Menzies. So he's someone we all listen to. But uh, I think uh, if you look at uh, the voices uh, in the government, we have uh, basically said time and time again, uh, particularly those of us who have argued strongly for a plebiscite or a public vote, is... Uh, let everybody else decide. Let the Australian people decide. We aren't going to uh, necessarily ram our thoughts down their throat. And if it doesn't uh, I, get up, this will be the end of it for the Liberal Party? Uh, if the vote, if there's a, a no vote, then uh, the people will have spoken. And uh, in that sense, we all have to abide by the decision of the people. I've said very publicly, even as someone who is uh, who's personally going to vote no and uh, believes in the traditional definition of marriage, uh, that if there's a yes vote, I will support it because that will be the will of the people. Conversely, uh, for those yes campaigners, if the will of the people is a no, uh, then we have to respect democracy and we have to respect what the Australian people have said. And uh, I think um, the questions often asked of me, will I respect the vote? I think the same question should be asked of uh, the proponents of same-sex marriage as well. Michael Sucker, always thanks as always, thank you for your time. Thanks a lot, Laura.